Methodist Church. for our sins he spent three days in a tomb but our sin couldn't hold him down because that's our God and that's our Savior would you sing this verse with me the Christ the Lord is risen today hallelujah sons of
Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Let's continue in worship as we go and behold and celebrate and share this incredible news of Christ risen.
praise of our heart, Lord, make us fully devoted to you. In a howl about idols, I stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me through the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be formed by feelings, I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, you can't hang me there with you. continue in worship as we just see some of the ways that Christ is transforming some of the people in our congregation. Good morning, church. My name is Nanette Lanch, and I am part of the Oasis Foster Adoption Ministry team. I want to thank you so much for your continued financial support and prayers. We could not adequately serve our foster kids and families without your generosity and giving spirit. Since January 2017, we have invested in hundreds of children's lives in the CPS system for providing clothes, diapers, baby items, gift cards, school supplies, Christmas gifts, and the crowd favorite parent night out. We ask and KUMC always delivers. Many of you have seen our friends from the AFS group home accompanied by their mentors on Sundays. This congregation has warmly welcomed them as they join us for worship. We have loved watching their confidence grow significantly, but it is also very exciting to see their hearts transform as they learn about Jesus and His gospel. That is the good news that we celebrate today, this Easter Sunday. I have been involved with the Harris County Child Protective Services for the last five years. The learning curve has been huge, and I am still trying to grasp all the complexities of the court. But the fact I learned very quickly that Harris County is in desperate need of foster and adoptive homes. As of February 2021, our Region 6 has 1,678 kids in care. In our local Kingwood, Humble, Atascacita area, there are 209 children in some type of substitute care, 60 kids waiting for adoption, and 133 foster homes. My intention when starting this ministry revolved around the opportunity to serve children in the foster care system, but it quickly became obvious that the kids in CPS care provided the opportunity to change me. This quote from C.T. Vivian sums this up perfectly. Hope is found near the ground in close proximity to the struggle. When you take the time to listen and learn their stories, it will often leave you speechless and heartbroken. Entering their lives by walking beside them through their grief can offer that hope that only Jesus can provide. This year, our ministry focus is changing in a very significant way. Instead of asking for financial offerings, we want to offer you an opportunity. Oasis wants to encourage your family to pray, ponder, and discuss the chance for you to step into a kid's life by providing a home and a safety net while their family hopefully heals. To consider being a foster parent is a huge and scary idea, but it is a step into obedience that the Lord will honor. 
Our team is confident some of you will take the challenge. Over the next few Sundays, we will introduce you to our tutor and mentoring team to offer you other ways that you can serve with us. Church, as we continue in this time of worship, I want to invite you to join me in prayer. Let's pray. God, over these last 40 plus days, you've, you've invited us to crossroad moments. Crossroad moments in scripture and crossroad moments in our lives. You've asked us to, to go to those moments and to, to stand, to look. You've, you've invited us to, to ask for the ancient paths and to, and to ask for the good way to travel. And God, you've, you've helped us to walk in your way. And in particular, in these last few days, this, this week that we call Holy Week, You've drawn us through encounter after encounter with you. You've taken us to, to the upper room to, to ask us if we would be ones who would follow you, who would, who would drink from the cup that you were about to drink from. You've taken us to the cross You've asked us if we would be willing to die. To die to ourselves. And even more importantly, to, to see your face, to hear your voice when we face the, the hardest moments in our life. When we face the, the hardest of, of diagnoses or failures or guilt or shame. When, when we face those moments when we think that and we know that we do not have the strength to overcome them ourselves. Well, we know at those crossroads that the death that you died for us so long ago is once again able to help us. To save us. To win the victory once again. And now, now you bring us to that beautiful place of resurrection. That day where your light and your hope burst through the darkness, burst forth from the grave, burst forth into the world in ways that, that make the, the darkness scatter and fear be resolved and, and all of guilt and all of shame and all of death and all of sin to be bundled together and to be won the victory over. And you invite us again to be an Easter people to be filled with hope and joy, to be filled with light and love, to stand at every crossroad and follow you because that's the best way. God, we've come here again today to decide if we will be your Easter people. God, for some of us, those are long journeys that we've already been walking and we've already given our altar of our lives to you in beautiful ways. For others of us, this is a, a first time that, that you're inviting us into this life. So come, Holy Spirit. Help each of us to walk in the way that leads to you. God, one of the special ways that we do this, one of, one of the ways that we show our commitment to you, our, our strength and our weakness to, together as community and as church, followed and filled by you, is to join our voices together and to pray the prayer that you taught us when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in our time of worship right now, and as, as Jeremy's about to come forward to, to share the word to us and to lead us into Holy Communion this Easter Sunday, this might be a great moment for you to pause the recording, to go get uh, that bread and that juice that you'll have in hand when it's time for us to share together. Let's now, in this moment, continue to receive what God wants to offer us this Easter day. In the early 90s, my wife took Bible Study Fellowship, and after looking over her shoulder for a year, I joined BSF. For the next 30 years, minus a couple years gap, I have attended BSF serving in leadership positions much of the time. BSF is an intense study of God's Word that helps us mature in our faith. Through it, God revealed to me that leading men into a deeper relationship with our Lord is one of my passions. Another passion I have discovered is prison ministry. Thanks to the walk to Emmaus and the urging of friends, I began doing Kairos ministry in the Polunsky unit. Bringing this very special course of Christianity, which showers the men in white with God's very special agape love, to Polunsky sold me on the need and beauty of prison ministry. When you witness firsthand the Holy Spirit transforming men's lives, you are hooked. I retired in 2018 and gave a lot of prayer and thought of what I was going to do in my retirement. God let me see that all along He was preparing me to meld these two passions together by taking BSF into prison. This was not the first satellite group of Kingwood Men's BSF into a prison. Another member of this church, Tom Stream, had started a BSF class in the Walls Unit a couple of years before I retired. He was my mentor, and I thank him greatly in paving the way. Polunsky is a maximum security prison that houses the men's death row in Texas. Thinking outside the box enabled us to set up a way that even the men on death row could participate in BSF. Lessons are hand-delivered, and the men in white can listen to the lecture over the Polunsky internal radio station, which broadcasts just to them. Afterwards, the men are encouraged to hand their questions in for us to review and communicate back to them with comments. To read these men's answers to the deeply probing questions of BSF is the most inspiring aspect of prison ministry this year. God is in the business of transforming lives, even on death row. When men who have done hideous crimes come to know God's forgiveness and love for them and turn their lives over to Christ, spiritual resurrection occurs. It takes your breath away. They are able to thank God for saving them to prison and thank Him for the opportunity to get introduced to Christ and a new life through faith in Him. They are serious Bible students who are starving to know God deeper and serve Him where they are. BSF in Polunsky, along with many other wonderful Christian programs, is a vital ministry of our sovereign Lord, Jesus Christ. Amazing ministries, like the ones Purvis just described at the Polunsky unit, are made possible because of your faithful, generous giving to Kingwood United Methodist Church. We'd encourage you to continue to give in those ways by mailing in your check, by texting, uh, your donation, or by giving online at the addresses that you see on the screen right now. Thank you for the way that you are helping us to be the church fueled by the resurrected Christ. Well, good morning or afternoon or whenever you're watching this. It's good to be with you here today online on Easter Sunday or whenever you happen to be listening to this or watching to this. It's good to be with you today. Well, I want to try something out. Um, there's no way to know if you'll actually follow directions because you're online and I'm up here doing this live. 
But uh, this is a call of the ancient church that they would do on Easter Sunday, and it's a call and response. And the one leading the congregation would say, the Lord is risen, and the congregation would respond, he is risen indeed. So wherever you find yourself, if it's at home, surrounded by family and friends, or if you're listening to this as a podcast, driving or running, I just want you to respond. So I'll say, the Lord is risen, and you say, he is risen indeed. So the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen, amen. Well, happy Easter Sunday here at Kingwood United Methodist Church. My name's Jeremy Bass, one of the pastors here on staff. It's really great to be with you. As Chris alluded to in our prayer, our sermon series this Lent and culminating on this Easter Sunday morning has been called Crossroads. where We've been looking at these moments where Jesus meets us in the crossroads and says, are you going to choose things my way or the world's way? And today we're looking at maybe not a crossroads moment, maybe just a regular roads moment that Jesus comes and meets with his disciples and turns into a crossroads moment. It's not a traditional Easter text, but it does happen on Easter, so I'm claiming it in Jesus' name. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. This is the Emmaus encounter that Jesus has with his disciples. So hear the good news of Jesus on Easter. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things? Jesus asked him. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went down to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish are you, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in Scripture concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. And when he was at the table, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning inside of us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up, returned at once to Jerusalem. Then they found the eleven and those who were with them and assembled together, saying, it is true, the Lord is risen, and he has appeared to Simon Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is such a beautiful encounter here in Luke's gospel. And and Jesus is funny. God's funny. If anyone tells you that God is not funny, just point them to this text because the start of this text is very, very funny. These two disciples, they're leaving Jerusalem going down, talking about Jesus. And then suddenly Jesus himself is walking right near them, walking with them. 
And it's just this very funny scene that these disciples have been kept from recognizing who Jesus is. And what's cool about this encounter is that these disciples are not the Peter, the James, and the John. They're two ordinary disciples. We're only given one of their names. One of their names is Cleopas. And in church history and tradition and in scripture after this, this is the only mention of this person. He doesn't have a great martyrdom story that we hear about recorded later in church history. He's not mentioned elsewhere in scripture. He just gets this one shining moment here on this road down to Emmaus. One of them doesn't even get a name. These are just ordinary disciples of Jesus Christ that Jesus meets on the day of his resurrection. It says in verse 13, on that same day, on the same day he rises from the dead, he meets with these ordinary people. Ordinary people just like you and me. People who aren't like Peter or Paul. Maybe just unnamed disciples. That Jesus meets with them on the day of his resurrection. And they're leaving Jerusalem after thinking that Jesus was going to be the one to bring about hope and restoration to Israel, they leave distraught, upset, going back home with their hopes shattered. Jesus says, what's, what's happening? What, what, what's going on? In verse 17, it says this, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along the road? And they stood still, they stopped walking, and their faces downcast. That's the effect that Jesus' death has had on them. And it says later in verse 21, explaining who this Jesus person is, it culminates in this in verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But we had hoped He was going to be the one to redeem Israel. But now that he's dead, that hope is gone. But we had hoped. For these disciples walking back home, their hope died with Jesus three days ago. And their hope is literally buried in a tomb with Jesus. They had hoped that he would come restore the kingdom of Israel. They're still putting this hope in this kind of political restoration of becoming a great nation again. But what they don't realize is Jesus has come to bring about the kingdom of God that looks vastly different from what their expectations were. And maybe you feel like these disciples. Maybe you feel like this, that you're walking away from Jerusalem and your hope is broken Your hope is buried and in a tomb. You lack hope. That your hope has been stolen. And you feel like these people, as you're trying to live your life, maybe this past 40 days or this past year, and you just feel like hope has been taken from you. And Jesus on the day of his resurrection, meets the disciples literally on the road back home and meets them where they are in their despair. Jesus meets his disciples in their despair here on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus meets us in the middle of our despair. The backdrop of Easter is shouted, is shrouded in despair about the death of Jesus Christ. We had hoped. We had hoped. But the truth of the resurrection and the truth of encountering a risen Jesus means that when we encounter the risen Christ, he gives us hope again. He gives us hope again or he gives us hope for the first time. Look at verse 25 and 27. Scripture says this, Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of scripture 
concerning himself. He opens up the scripture to him, and when Jesus in the New Testament, when they talk about scripture, they're talking about the Old Testament. And so Jesus goes through the Old Testament, he shows these people from the very beginning, the writings of Moses, starting in Genesis, all the way through the prophets, he explains the whole of scripture and says, can't you see that it's all pointing to me? Can't you see that my suffering, death, and resurrection were foretold in the writings that you hold dear? And he opens it up to them. And he shows what Jesus had predicted, what the scriptures had predicted, is what's coming to pass here and now in these days. That their hope wasn't meant to be killed. And these were skeptics of the resurrection. They had literally heard the women say, an angel told us that Jesus is alive. And they're like, ah, I think I need a bit more convincing. And so what Jesus does is he meets them on the road and does the convincing himself. Jesus gives hope to these two random disciples in the midst of their despair, in the midst of their hopelessness. And the hope of Easter is that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is alive, that the cross and death and sin does not have power over Jesus. That God has power over death, which means that death has been defeated and God himself has power over death. The greatest enemy that you or I will ever face is death. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we celebrate here today, Jesus has overcome our greatest enemy. He has conquered death, conquered sin, The resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus is the ultimate proof of the victory of God. But it can be hard to see that. It can be hard to see the hope if you're like these disciples and you're in the middle of this mess you find yourself in. If you're in the middle of darkness, if you're in the middle of despair, You know, you may be like these disciples where you think, all I know is that Jesus is dead and my hope is gone. You may feel like these disciples and thinking, we had hope. We had hope, but something over this past year has changed. Something over this past decade has changed. Something over these past few months have happened where I did have hope, but now I find that it's gone. Now I find that something has been taken from me. Something is missing. And all I see is a dead Jesus lying in the grave. You may have felt like this past year that you were like these disciples with your face downcast. And it's hard to see hope in the middle of that season of your life. You know, I've mentioned this before. Uh, The Lord helped heal me of anxiety. And one of the things that, as he was going through this healing journey with me, and it was really a journey, uh, things got really, really rough before they got better. And some days were really hard, and I felt like these disciples, where my face was downcast, and I said, I had hope. And I don't know if this season of my life is ever going to end. Jesus, I know that you made these promises to me, but right now it just really stinks. And right now, I don't know if I'll ever get out of the darkness. And one day, Erica and I were praying about this. It was one of those really rough, difficult, dark days. And the Lord gave her an image of what I was going through. She said, I just get this picture that you're on a train track right now. You know, uh, we don't have trains down here in Houston that have tunnels. But if you go somewhere else, it has mountains and stuff. Uh, trains go underneath the tunnels. And when you go underneath the tunnel, that's pitch black. They don't have windows in tunnels. And when it's pitch black, you don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going. And she said, Jeremy, I feel like you're in a tunnel right now. And the darkness is all around you. And you don't see any light right now. But if you just follow along the track that God is going, that God is leading you in, just like a train always leaves the tunnel and goes into the light, God is going to bring you out of this and bring you into the light. So I just kept following the tracks, and sure enough, the Lord led me out of the darkness 
and into the light. Because sometimes we don't know how long that'll take. But eventually, we always find ourselves in the light. Maybe you feel like that. That the season that you're in is a season of darkness that will never seem to end. And you don't know if you'll ever see the light again. But the truth of the resurrection and the reality that Jesus Christ rose from the dead means that there will always be light at the end of the tunnel, no matter what you face. Even if you face death itself, Jesus is the power of death, the sting of death, no longer has hold over you. That darkness, despair, does not get the final word in your life. Jesus Christ gets the final word. That is the hope of Easter. That light always comes. That resurrection always comes, even in the face of death itself. And so not only do we see that Jesus gives us hope on Easter, but when we encounter the risen Christ like these disciples, Jesus transforms our life. Jesus transforms our lives. Look at verses 31 and 32. Jesus is opening up the scripture to them. He invites them in and he reveals himself and then he disappears. And it says this in verse 31. Their eyes were open and they recognized him. Then he disappeared from their sight. And they looked at each other and they asked, Were not our hearts burning within us? Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? Encountering the risen Christ, encountering Jesus, set their hearts on fire and transformed their despair and their hopelessness into joy. On resurrection, on the resurrection of Jesus, he restores hope into our lives because without the resurrection of Jesus, all we have is a dead Jesus lying in a tomb. And everything these disciples say on the road down to Emmaus is 100% correct if Jesus does not rise from the dead. That our hope is meaningless, that our faith, what we declare and preach every single day, is worthless and meaningless. If Jesus Christ does not rise from the dead, Because if he does not rise from the dead, we are dead in our sins. But Jesus does rise from the dead. And death and despair does not have final power over him. And when they encounter the risen Christ, they say everything is different now. That Jesus rising from the dead changes everything. And they can have hope again. I mean, if you just think about the disciples after Jesus is dead, They're hiding and they're afraid. And then Jesus comes and he reveals himself to them. And then the Holy Spirit is poured out over him and these 11 men go from hiding in a room to being willing to die for Jesus. And 10 of the 11 apostles die a martyr's death. And if you just see Jesus die, it's not worth dying for. But if you encounter the risen Christ like these men did, like these apostles did, that if you see Jesus rise from the dead and he transforms your heart, then that is a God who is worth dying for. That is a message worth dying for. You don't die for a dead Jesus, but you will die for a risen king, the one who conquers death and brings us new life that we can have an encounter like these disciples had with the risen Christ because Jesus is alive, that their hearts were set on fire as Jesus opened up the scriptures to them, that Jesus and the Spirit opened up the scriptures to us as we read the witnesses of what God did in the lives of people long ago, and he sets our hearts on fire and reveals himself to us and convinces us of the truth of the gospel. My dad, when he was a teenager, came across John 10.10, which says, I I have come that you might have life and life to the fullest. And he said, I want that. 
And Jesus and my dad in reading those pages in scripture as a teenager gave his life to Christ because he encountered the risen Jesus in the pages of scripture. And he said, this is a God that I believe has come to give me life. And myself, as I was reading, there's an account in the gospel of Matthew where Jesus goes to the, or I think it's blind men. And the blind men said, Jesus, can you heal us? And Jesus says to the blind men, do you believe that I can heal you? And as I was reading that one day, I just felt Jesus just convict my soul. Do you believe that I can heal you of your anxiety? Do you believe that I am a God who is capable of that? That Jesus brought restoration and hope to my soul through the pages of Scripture that I encountered a risen Jesus. I encountered a resurrected God on the pages of Jesus, on the pages of Scripture as he opened them up to me. Jesus set my heart on fire for this hope. Jesus set the heart of my Father on fire for this hope of the gospel. And ever since Jesus walked out of that tomb, he's been setting hearts on fire for 2,000 years. And he wants to do that with us here today and with many more Christians in the years ahead. That the hope of God gives transformation And he sets our souls on fire. And he makes us alive because our greatest enemy of sin and death and Satan have been defeated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think I talked about this. I think it was actually Christmas Eve I talked about this last. This idea of existentialism, which is what I believe is the predominant philosophy in our society And existentialism is basically that there's this fundamental underlying belief that all of life is meaningless. Rather than looking at that meaninglessness of life and choosing despair, we say, you know what, I'm going to look at the meaninglessness of life and create my own meaning for it. And that's where we get this idea of existential dread. It's where you have this sort of moments in creating your meaning for your life where you realize this is ultimately meaninglessness. And you have just this dread of what is the purpose if I'm just going to die one day. But Christianity and the message of the cross and the message of the empty tomb shows us a God who provides meaning to our lives. A God who provides purpose to our lives by taking on human flesh, saying life is worth me redeeming. To give hope in meaning to our lives, to give purpose to our lives, and to set our souls on fire because he has come to make us new and to bring newness into our lives. So I'm going to invite the band back up. I just want you to take a moment and just respond to what the Spirit has been doing over the course of the service, over the course of this message. You know, you may be like those disciples and be thinking, I had hope. I had hope, but I don't have it anymore. And you may just be screaming in your soul, Lord, I want that hope. Maybe you've lost that hope, or maybe you've never had that hope before. And so if that's you, I would just just encourage you to just talk with the Lord. Just pray to him. All prayer is is just talking with him. And if you don't know the words, just say, Jesus, give me the words. And just say, Jesus, come and meet me here. Jesus, come and restore hope. Jesus, I want that resurrection life that you have promised in the Gospels. Jesus, I want that purpose in my life. Jesus, I want my soul set on fire. Come and see that life in the victory of God, that he has won for you over your darkness, that he has won for you over your hopelessness. On the screen right now is going to be a text in church uh, number. If you want to text the keyword and the number on the screen right now. If you want to talk with someone more about this, we would love to have a further conversation with you and just walk you through this because we have come to believe We have encountered a risen God on the road to Emmaus, 
and our hearts on set on fire, and we want yours to be set on fire as well. We're also going to be taking Holy Communion now. And if you wanted to get your bread and juice with your family, or even if it's just you in a room. You know, Jesus opened the eyes of his disciples when he did a meal like this, when he broke bread with them. Jesus, just a few days ago, as we remember, when he was with his friends, he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, even Judas, the one who would betray him to a Roman cross. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. And then after the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So Holy Spirit, come into this place. Pour yourself out over these gifts of bread and juice in every single home, in every single location that you just make your dwelling place there. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered in homes, gathered with friends. And Lord, make us, pour your Holy Spirit out on us that we may be for the world the body and blood of Christ, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, Lord, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until you, Jesus, come in your final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet and experience life forevermore. Amen. So if you want to take the bread, this is the body of Christ, which he broke for you. Taking the juice, this is the blood of our Lord, which he shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. We're going to be singing to close the song, Set a Fire. It's a lovely song that's taken directly from these passages in Scripture. And so, as you sing it, don't just make it another song. Make it a prayer. Lord, come, do a new thing. Set a fire in my soul. Come and meet me, resurrected King. Amen.
can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. She said I fire down in my soul, that I can't contain, that I can't control. God's doing in our church this week. Good morning, KUMC members, friends, and guests. I'm Chris Harrison, one of the pastors on staff at the church. We hope that you find worship today inspiring as we celebrate the risen Christ this Easter Sunday. Some of you joining us today are longtime members, while others may be checking us out for the first time. In any case, we're really glad you're here. Let me tell you about a few ways that you can connect to Christ and one another, grow in your faith, and serve in love here at KUMC. We know that not everyone is comfortable returning just yet to in-person worship. If you'd like to join in some part of the on-campus Easter experience, we invite you to a special Easter drive through communion and prayer. It happens at 3 p.m. today. Our senior pastor, Bert Palmer, will meet you in front of Society of St. Stephen for a socially distanced drive through moment, sharing communion elements and a brief prayer. Again, that's today at 3 p.m. One of our unique worship opportunities is the healing and prayer service. It's coming up next Sunday, April 11th, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. It will take place in the Vine Space, where our contemporary worship service meets. This month, our pastoral intern, Deneen Goldsmith, will be teaching in the service, and her husband, Rev. Stephen Goldsmith, will be helping to lead worship. If you've attended, you know how powerful this service can be in your own personal journey toward wholeness. If you've been wanting to come, but haven't had the opportunity to attend, now might be the time. If you haven't attended before, know that this worship event is a safe, holy place where we share music, teaching moments, prayer time, and prayer stations. Trust me when I say that it will be an amazing evening that you'll want to check out. Finally, a way to connect and grow through generous service arises as we gather on Sunday, April 18th for the JT Barger Dessert Auction. The JT Barger Memorial brings in revenue from both the dessert auction and the annual golf tournament. To date, we've raised more than $300,000 to support college scholarships and student missions. The dessert auction will feature both a silent and live auction. The opportunity to vote on your favorite student cake is always a highlight of the evening. Know that tables normally sell out fast, so register your group of eight today 
by visiting the student ministry page of our website. In accordance with our protocols, we are reducing the number of tables in the gym to provide for social distancing and masks will be required while moving about the gym. Thank you for your continued support and we look forward to seeing you on the 18th. Thank you for joining us in the Vine. For more information on the ways you can connect to KUMC, visit us on the web at kingwoodumc.org. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. When you look before you and you feel Jesus inviting you into deeper life, will you join me and say, I want more. Stay with me. Teach me. Lead me. Help me be the church, the person, the man, the woman that you want me to be. May we live into the life, this Easter resurrection life that God invites us into through Christ so that we may go into the world and share the greatest news of all, that he is risen. He is risen indeed, and the world will never be the same. If you want to see one more beautiful witness of what God's doing in the lives of people here at Kingwood United Methodist Church, Stick around for just a minute and listen to this testimony of what it looks to live a change and resurrection life. Go in peace.